Thank you, Rob, for leading us in worship. Really appreciate that time. I need that every week just to recalibrate my, my, uh, my heart, my mind, and we do that. Psalm 100 instructs us, enter into his presence with singing, okay? It's not just, you know, that God is pleased with that. It does something for our hearts. So thank you for doing that this morning. I could hear you singing behind me, so thank you. Well, please open your Bibles to Hebrews 13, and if you don't have a Bible, grab one on the back table. Don't be shy. Get up, get that. There's also some sermon notes back there that uh, you want to have with you and in front of you. How do you know what someone really believes, okay, in their heart, in their soul, not just on their lips, You know, we talked a little bit about it last week and lessons that we learn from storms. You know, when when our cups get bumped, uh, storms tend to reveal what's going on inside of our hearts. Well, we looked at this verse last week. Jesus tells us this is how you know what someone really believes. Matthew 7, verse 20. Yes, just as you can identify a tree by its fruit... So, in the same way, you can identify people by what? Their actions. See, if I tell you, hey, I just planted this tree in my yard, and there's a tag on it that says it's an apple tree. Well, how do I know if it really is an apple tree? Yeah, you look for apples. Now, it may take time. Maybe it's a young tree, needs to get established, but eventually you should see fruit. Actions. What we do is our fruit. That's what reveals what's actually inside of us. Now, our confession, our profession, things that we say with our lips, it does matter. But over time, our profession, our confession, should be validated in our actions. All right, where's the fruit? I'm looking for the fruit. So here's our big idea today. Vertical convictions, what I believe, shows up in horizontal actions, what I do. So what you believe about God, who he is, how you relate to him, okay, those vertical convictions absolutely should be impacting how you live, what you do, and what you don't do. Now, here's an example. Some of you know our two daughters. Uh, They are followers of Jesus, and as a parent, and those of you who are parents, that's not something to take for granted. I'm extremely grateful that our daughters are following Jesus. They married godly men. They're raising their children, our grandchildren, in the faith. So grateful for this. Now, if you remember, when they were younger, they were dating, and uh, when they got engaged, they kept their relationship sexually pure, all right? They waited until they got married. Why would they do that? They believed. They had vertical convictions. That was God's will. But those convictions of faith... Their horizontal actions put them out of sync with their culture around them, especially with their peers. I mean, you can imagine today. And this connects with our text that we're going to be in this morning. See, their commitment to uh, faithfulness, to purity for a lifetime, was to many of their peers old-fashioned at best. But... As they fix their eyes on Jesus, as they're running to him, as they cling to that vertical relationship with God, it is impacting their horizontal commitments and actions. See, when we take our eyes off Jesus, here's what happens. We drift, uh, we lose our way, and our actions, what we do, begins to align with the world rather than with God. So, Hebrews chapter 13, where we're starting today, as we get into this last chapter of Hebrews, 
This is the progression that we're going to see. For 12 chapters, I mean, the preacher has laid out chapter after chapter of vertical convictions, things that are true about God, things that are true about us, things that are true about how we relate to God, things about the future, what is going to happen. And like so many letters in the New Testament, it starts with these deep convictions and doctrines reminding people what we believe, then it moves to the practical implications of how should we then live based on those beliefs. That's chapter 13, uh, and we mentioned it last week. One of the key words in the New Testament, it was originally written in Greek, and I don't quote this very often, but it's important here. The Greek words in the New Testament for worship, it can mean two things. It, the word is latruo. It's not important for you to know that, but here's what is important. It can mean two things. Worship, it can also mean serve, to do, to worship and to serve, to do. And it's the word that we see right at the end of Hebrews chapter 12. If you've got your Bibles open, verse 28, the author says, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. It could very well have been tra translated, let us offer to God acceptable service with reverence and awe. Vertical and horizontal devotion in one word. True worship. True worship does. It acts. So these convictions about who God is and what he has done for us, uh, for those of us who believe, what he's done for those of us who have trusted in Jesus to save us, to bring us home to heaven, to bring us to himself, they not only drive us to worship, which we just did in song, in prayer, in that kind of reverence and awe, but they also drive us to live for God, to serve him, to play our part in his plan. So I want you to think about worship is not just something I come to do on Sunday mornings. Worship shows up in what we do every day, 24-7. Amen? Worship does. Well, let's pray as we dive into this text. God, thank you for these truths. We know that um, it begins in our hearts, and true faith uh, has to have uh, be in true things. So God, we have been studying, we've been listening, we're asking for you to penetrate our hearts that we would not uh, believe falsehoods, we wouldn't believe what the world is saying, we would believe you above all else. And God, as we put our faith and trust in you, as you transform our hearts and minds, that we, it would work its way out into our actions, that there would be fruit that the confession, the profession of our lips would be evidenced in our hands and in our feet. So Lord, teach us this morning, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we just looked at it at the end of Hebrews 12. Uh, the preacher here says, let us offer to God acceptable worship, uh, acceptable service. Let's offer to him actions that are in line with, with all of these beliefs that we've said and then he begins to tell us, what does that look like? So starting there in verse 1, uh, everyday worship, first of all, it shows up in our love for others. In our love for others. And now he, he outlines three groups of people who should feel our love. Our vertical convictions about God show up in this way. First, it affects how you treat fellow believers. So look at verse 1. Four words in my Bible. <laughs> Let brotherly love continue. That's one sentence, one verse. Let brotherly love continue. Now, again, Greek word here. You actually have heard it many times. You may not know. It's the word for brotherly love. You ready? Philadelphia. 
You knew some Greek. Okay, that means brotherly love. Uh, and the New Testament was originally written in Greek. Greek is a very precise language. Okay, English has one word for love. Uh, what is that word? Very good. That was a trick question, but some of you, very smart. Uh, Greek actually has multiple words for love. Um, eros, okay, it's, it represents kind of the erotic or sexual love. Phileo, okay, that's brotherly love, how we love one another. Okay, agape, um, that's unconditional love. It's the kind of love that God has for us. So Jesus actually told his followers that love, actually an agape type of love, the kind of love God has for us, if you have that for one another, this is going to be the defining characteristic of a disciple. John 13 says this, a new commandment I give to you, that you what? Love one another. In fact, just as I have loved you, you also are to what? Love one another. By this, by that action, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Love, it's essential to our mission. Now sometimes, oftentimes, just look around the room, the people you worship together with are not the people you might naturally spend time with. See, church can often be a very unexpected community of people of different backgrounds, different education, uh, different socioeconomic situations, even different cultures. Church is not to be, it's not meant to be a country club. It's a supernatural fellowship of diverse people who've been adopted into God's family through faith in Jesus. And when the world sees this, sees us out in the lobby going, why are these people gathering together? What are they doing? When the world sees this strange mix of different people loving one another, like family, like brothers and sisters, it's supposed to get their attention. Wow, these people must be followers of Jesus. What they say is actually true. They're disciples. And when we share together these, these vertical convictions about faith in God, um, fixing our eyes on Jesus, it makes our differences with one another seem smaller. We're family. Now that's easier, easier to do when times are good, but hardships, persecution, when that's happening, that can distract us, and that's what was going on in the church that the preacher here was writing this letter to, and so what does he tell them? Let brotherly love, what? Continue. Friends, keep on loving one another. Something was going on. Something was causing the members of the church to dial back their love for one another. A couple chapters earlier, chapter 10, verse 24, if you remember, he says, don't give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. Something was going on, causing people to pull back from the church. Cultural, cultural pressure was causing them to pull back. Following Jesus and loving other people who are following Jesus was suddenly getting hard and it was getting dangerous in some ways. I don't know if you've ever experienced a conflict with someone at church. <laughs> if you've been in church any long period of time, I'm, I'm assuming this has happened. But when that happens, is, th is this what happened? Did you... Or did the other person just check out? Okay, this being in relationship thing with people in the church just got hard. I'm done. You know, as long as it's easy, 
as long as church is fun, as long as I get along with these people, well, then I'm in. But if it gets hard, I don't need that. I'm out. So when that happens, not if, when those things happen, what is it that compels us to continue, to let brotherly love continue? It's our vertical convictions. If I don't have these vertical convictions, I'm out. See, God has shown me grace and mercy that I don't deserve. God has forgiven me. He has loved me even when I don't deserve it. God doesn't give up on me even when I fail him. Ah, so I can show grace. I can show mercy. I can forgive. You know what? I can keep on loving these people. When we do that, that is a form of worship that we are giving to God. It's sacrifice. It's an offering to God when we keep on loving fellow believers. That's the first effect. Secondly, the, these vertical convictions affect how we treat strangers. All right, let's look at verse 2. Chapter 13, verse 2. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. That's where that verse is. Did you know that's in the Bible? I think people have heard this. It's actually in the Bible. So hospitality is a form of love. It's when you're sharing your time, your energy, your resources, your home, whatever it is, with someone that you don't know. Okay, that's, that's costly love. Here, here's maybe what's going on in our minds. <clears throat> Boy, you know, I'm willing to be inconvenienced for a, a family member. I, oh, I'm willing to be inconvenienced for a friend. But you know, my time, my resources are precious. I don't have margin to spend them on someone who's not connected to me in some way. Now, we may not say that. It doesn't sound very generous or compassionate, but it's often what we do. Now, back in the time when this was written, back in the ancient Roman times, they didn't really have hotels like we do today. Um, and if they did, okay, they weren't family-friendly places. Uh, it was more like a bar or a tavern and there were rooms up above, and they often served, served as a brothel. So if you were traveling, you often depended on a stranger allowing you to stay in their home. Can you imagine the opportunity that this gave for followers of Jesus to share the gospel? Show hospitality. It's almost an automatic opportunity. See, our willingness, even today to create some margin in our lives for strangers. Do I have any margin in my life for strangers? Am I, am I just have my radar up, you know, for somebody who I don't know, but I might have an opportunity to show some hospitality towards them. Our willingness to do that is often a measure of how much margin we have in our lives for God. You know, maybe, maybe this is why the preacher throws out this kind of little carrot about angels unawares. Um, I mean, there's plenty of evidence in the Bible that, that God or an angel from God sometimes shows up in disguise as a stranger. Okay, he did this for Abraham. He did this for Gideon. He, he did this for a few others. And here's what the stranger is usually looking for. Hospitality a meal, a place to stay, directions. Um, and when the person who's being inconvenienced by the stranger responds with hospitality, with sacrifice, giving their time and their resources to help this person, what happens in the Bible? God blesses them. There's no reason to believe that God does not do this today. No reason to believe that. It says it right here. This may still happen. 
So, do you notice? Are you looking? Do you have enough margin to say, hey, somebody needs some hospitality. I think that person needs some help. Um, maybe you've helped a stranger in the past. Maybe you have a testimony about this, how, how you were blessed by doing that. In fact, Jesus tells us this in Matthew 25. You know these verses. Jesus says, for I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a what? Stranger, and you welcomed me. And I'm sure, you know, this is what, this is what we would be saying. Well, Jesus, when did we see you? <laughs> I don't remember doing that for you. When did, when, when did we see you as a stranger and welcome you? And Jesus says this, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brothers... You did it to me. I, I'm sure if we knew it was Jesus, we would, boom, we would help. But Jesus says, no, do it to a stranger. Um, that's when you're doing it for me. So don't neglect this showing hospitality. It will be costly. It's going to require margin in life. It requires something we have to be very intentional about. But uh, our vertical convictions are going to show up in these horizontal actions. And then one more relationship that, that they affect. It's how we treat the needy. And you might even just write next to it, put a slash, the persecuted. Okay, so it's the needy, but really it's the persecuted. Look at verse 3. Remember those who are in prison as though you are in prison with them. And those who are mistreated, since you also are in the body. Okay, this is really a test of our compassion. I mean, strangers can be costly, um, but those who are in need, those who are being persecuted, those who are being mistreated, this can be uncomfortable, especially those uh, when they're in prison or being mistreated. Now, prison ministry, if, if anybody's done this, it's amazing. I've ministered in prisons all over the world. I've seen some amazingly dire conditions in third world countries. But whenever I've done prison ministry, I've always, always been met with incredible gratitude. Prisoners know that it's uncomfortable for non-prisoners to show them love. But the prisoners that are referenced here, who are they talking about? They're actually people who are being imprisoned for their faith. It says, remember them because you also are in the body like them. Okay, that's what was going on in the culture. Christians were being persecuted. Um, there was significant risk when you showed love and identified and touched people who were being persecuted for their faith. By associating caring for them, you're putting yourself at risk. Oh, are you one of them too? Here's the question. Are we willing to be mistreated for the gospel? Are we willing to be mistreated for our faith? It's a test of our vertical convictions for sure, but it's also this. It's a form of worship. If I say I love God, if I sing songs of praises to him, but I do not love my fellow brother, or I do not show hospitality to strangers, if I don't associate with those who are being mistreated because of their faith and because of the gospel, what does that say about my worship? Maybe it's not acceptable. In fact, John in the letter of 1 John, says this, 1 John 3, if someone has enough money to live well, that's many of us in Naples, and sees a brother or sister in need, oh, but does not show compassion, shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? Okay? These two things don't go together. He says, dear children, let's not merely say that we love one another. Let us show the truth by what? 
our actions. See, true worship does. So our horizontal actions or our lack of horizontal actions, it actually reveals what our vertical convictions truly are. Um, what it is that we worship affects what we do. So, very interestingly, now the next application the preacher makes is this. Everyday worship shows up in this, our commitment to marriage. All right, let me just read verse 4. Let marriage be held in honor among all, among all. And let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. So, like I said uh, earlier, our, our biblical view of marriage just is what my daughters discovered by living out their vertical convictions. Uh, these convictions about marriage are increasingly under attack in our culture, a culture that has abandoned God's truth, God's revealed truth about marriage. And when you lose these, these vertical convictions, here's what happens. This is what's going on in our world. We lose, uh, we get lost in the horizontal actions. So these convictions that we just read uh, the actions that are in line with them, it's actually a form of worship. So here's three convictions about marriage that we believe it's in the Bible. First, we believe that marriage is honored. Okay, it's sacred. Not something to be experimented with and, and changed and manipulated. Let it be held in honor by all. Now, this is not just for those who are married. It says by all, everyone should see and understand the sacred purpose and picture of marriage. Okay, so even if you're not married, you can honor and respect and uphold a commitment to what marriage is meant to be. Everyone should see and understand that. God made us male and female. Not simply so we could procreate, um, he designed this marriage as a way for us to reveal something wonderful about him. Paul talks about it in Ephesians 5. We'll put it on the screen. He says, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, a female, and the two shall become one flesh. And then he says, hey, this mystery of what's going on there is actually profound because it actually refers to Christ and the church. Then he says, however, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Okay? There's an honoring here. Now, not everyone gets married. Not everyone stays married. But everyone can honor. Everyone can appreciate Everyone can help support and encourage marriages that do bring glory to God. And a faithful marriage is worship in action. So contrary to our culture, we, we also believe this about marriage. Marriage is kept pure. It says, let the marriage bed be undefiled. All right, this is part of what drove my daughters okay, in their convictions uh, it, there's a sacredness of sexual purity and faithfulness. Now, to the ancient world, much like ours today, um, I mean, that was crazy. Uh, temptations to find sexual satisfaction outside of marriage must have been a problem for him to tell the church this. Uh, what we know about ancient Rome, it was a decadent place, and it was actually an accepted cultural norm uh, for infidelity. Okay? No one was expected to be sexually faithful. Uh, so followers of Jesus, uh, having horizontal actions that were aligned with these vertical convictions, uh, you faced serious cultural harassment for, you, for these horizontal commitments to faithful marriage. And that is true today. See, when we take our eyes off of Jesus, if we forget that 
We're not home yet. We're heading there. If we forget that, you know what, I, I actually am a stranger in this world. Um, if we lose these, these vertical convictions, then moral purity, marital purity, is at serious risk. And to drive that home to us, the preacher goes vertical again, and he says this third thing. We believe marriage is actually defended by God. I mean, these are serious words. God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. It's the acceptable worship um, is authentic worship. You know, I can't, can't hide anything from God. Um, when I know I can't hide anything from God, he sees everything. That's a vertical conviction that is going to affect my horizontal actions. Um, if I know, if I believe, I know that God has said he's going to judge the sexually immoral why would I ever compromise this? So if you're a follower of Jesus, he's writing this to Christians. This is what has to happen in your own mind and in your own heart to be able to do this. You have to deceive yourself. You have to overcome vertical convictions, true things that God said in his word. I have to deceive myself. In fact, this is what Paul warns us about in Galatians 6. He says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh, okay, will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. So, okay, let's not mock God. Instead, let's, let's worship him. And, and having a commitment uh, to marriage, having a commitment to help support godly marriages that are being faithful to one another uh, is actually a form of worship. Well, now the preacher kind of goes right to the heart, and he says this, your everyday worship is going to show up in this. You ready? Contentment. Contentment. It's a fruit that evidences uh, you are what you say you are. God is working in your life. There's contentment. So let's read verses 5 and 6. He says, keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Now, a lot of times we see uh, biblical commands as a negative thing. Okay, the Ten Commandments. It's a bunch of thou shalt nots. But the reason for a negative command is so that we can experience the positive side of God's provision. We've talked about sin, one definition of what is sin, it's trying to meet a legitimate need. Okay, you've got a legitimate need somewhere inside of you, but you're trying to meet it in an illegitimate way. So when we're tempted to sin, if we can just pull back a little bit and ask ourselves, what is the need that I'm trying to meet in my life by doing this? What, what is the true need here in my soul or in my body? And once we get to the core of identifying what is it that I'm trying to satisfy, then before we leap into the illegitimate provision, we should say, well, what is God's legitimate provision to meet that need? I can almost guarantee you it's probably not as easy. It's not as quick not as tantalizing as the illegitimate option. But I'm pretty confident of this. If, if it's a legitimate need you've identified, God has a legitimate provision for it, and he wants you 
to experience it. So here's, here's three things that contentment opens the door for us to experience when we can look to God uh, to meet these needs. First, he wants you to experience his passion. Okay, this is his love. And the preacher says, keep your life free from the love of what? Money. Is he saying that having money is wrong? That's not what he's saying. He's saying it's the love of money that's a problem. Um, that's a disease. The love of money is a de- disease that can affect the rich. It can affect the poor. Contentment is, is true worship because what it does is it frees us from the love of money so that we can actually love God. In fact, Jesus said you can't do both. Matthew 6. No one can serve. It's the word for worship. No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted, he'll worship the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. You cannot worship God and money. It's not about having money. It's about loving money. It's about worshiping money. So keep your life filled with the love of God. It will free you from the tyranny of loving money. So I hope I'm clear here. This is not about having money. It's about money having you. You see the difference? So vertical convictions affect your horizontal actions. Contentment brings freedom so that you can experience fully God's love, his passion. But secondly, contentment allows you to actually experience God's provision. Second thing. Verse 5, it says, be content with what you have. So let's think about some some vertical convictions. Um, I'm not going to quote a Bible verse for each one, but, but I think these are pretty obvious. So let's ask ourselves, do I believe this? God is in complete control our world, and our lives. I mean, do you believe that? He's in complete control, okay? Second thing, do I believe this? God has a plan for history. He has, he has a plan for me. That there's a part that he has for us. He has a part for you to play in his plan. Do I believe that? He's in control. He has a plan. Yes, I, I believe that. Okay, third thing. God, do I believe that God has access to every resource on the planet to use it, to accomplish his plan, to give it to us so that we can play our part? Okay, do I believe those things? All right, well, then let's, let's look at a Bible verse, Philippians 4.19. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Do I believe that? It's a promise. Sounds like a promise. Not a promise to supply everything I want, but everything I need. All right, let's put it all together. I mean, if I believe all those things that I just said, how's it going to affect my horizontal actions I mean, if I'm just walking in faith, which we're not talking about perfection, okay, but if you're walking in faith, you're making progress in following Jesus, there's fruit in your life, I'm trusting God with my life, I'm, I'm offering acceptable worship and service to him in these practical ways, then as I look at the provision that God has given me, it might be a lot that he's entrusted you with, it might be a little that he's entrusted you with. Here should be the conclusion. It's enough. It's enough. God knows what I need. He's promised to give it to me. So if I want to experience God's provision, all I really need to do is look at what I have. Okay. 
this must be what I need for today. This is, must be what I need. This must be all I need uh, to do what God's asking me to do. That kind of contentment is worship. Discontentment. Well, I don't have what I need. I can't serve God. I can't do that. I, until I get more, unless God shows some other way, I, I can't do it. That's discontentment. That's not worship. But then there's this next vertical conviction. It's perhaps the most powerful driver of our horizontal actions uh, and our emotions. And it's, it's really what gives us the confidence that we need to live by faith in a fallen world. God wants you to experience, and this comes with contentment here, he wants you to experience his presence, his very presence. Look at the end of verse 5. He says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. If that's true, verse 6, we can confidently say, then the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Do you see the freedom that that brings? I mean, life in a fallen world gets challenging at times, very challenging. Um, the good news of the gospel, the good news of placing your faith and hope in Jesus is not that he removes all the difficulties. That's not God's plan this side of heaven. Once you put your faith in Jesus, all of a sudden life gets easy. In fact, he promises, as we saw last week, to use those difficulties actually for your good, to grow you, to mature you. He promises to be with you, to protect you as you trust him. See, the good news is this. We actually sang it earlier in the song. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For you are with me. You're with me. It's God's presence. Whatever you're struggling with right now, if you're walking by faith, trusting him, God is with you. God is with us. And that vertical conviction, God is with us. God is with me. It gives you the confidence to face any challenge life may bring. So what are the challenges that you're facing right now? We've got them. Okay, everybody's got challenges. The first step in facing these challenges is not just focusing on the challenge. It's looking up. It's worship. It's fixing our eyes on Jesus. It's remembering what we know are true, these vertical convictions that he's in complete control. He's promised his presence. He's never going to leave you. He's never going to forsake you. And have confidence. The Lord is my helper. These convictions will affect your actions. I don't need to be afraid. If God is with me, I mean, there's nothing anyone can do to me that's outside of God's loving care and plan. Do this with me. Take a deep breath. Do it again. God is with me. See, that kind of contentment that's rooted in convictions, it's, it's actually worship. It's acceptable worship. It's, it's something any of us can do, not just Sunday mornings, but every single day. Amen? Let me pray for us. Lord, thank you for these, these words. <laughs> it says, you have said, God, I will never leave you nor forsake you. God, thank you for that truth that, that drives us to take a deep breath and know that, God, you're, you're going to be with us. It's going to be okay. Whatever we're going through, even if it's hard, you will use for good for us, for others, for our world. 
for your glory. So Lord, as we move on this morning, may, may we be changed because we've been reminded that when we say we're a follower of Jesus, it means we love others, even when it's costly. It means that we're committed to things that are very countercultural, like faithful marriage, sexual purity. Lord, those are serious things that are important to you. And Lord, help us to let go of those things that have us. Maybe it's money. Maybe it's uh, something else, Lord, that's not you. We, we, we can't have our devotion and our worship directed at other things. Um, we want them only focused on you, God. And as we do that, we know that you are our helper. We don't have to be afraid. There's nothing, nothing man can do to me. There's nothing this world can do to me that will separate me from your love your provision. God, we need you. We need you desperately.